by early 1900, there were growing uh, issues with governance, particularly public administration and trade that required educated uh, Africans. And there were rules that allow the colonial administration to pay only a fraction that what was paid to um, colonial um, administrators, which makes uh, African, educated African, a relatively cheap source of labor. So, but then they face a uh, dilemma, you know, they feared while they are building school, they fear that educated Africans will demand more freedom when they met with the hard limits to social mobility and in colonial society. You know, and this is based in part from the experience in India where uh, increased education led to um, basically movement against the colonial rule. So we didn't want to repeat the same mistake um, in Africa. Okay, let me come then to the patterns in the data on colonial education. There are three points I'm going to, um, to stress. One is that the investment in education were very small. But then despite that, as we'll see later, it has very important, sometimes massive effect on social mobility and political engagement. And African demanded more Western education, not less. And uh, as I said you know, early on, colonial power fear that education will threaten their control. So um, as I said earlier, again, uh, primary education remained very scarce. So the education um, investment uh, were made with no contribution to metropole. Investment tend to concentrate over time as marginal flow to areas where existing facility and locally high demand for education exists. And the low level of uh, uh, investment made were through grants to missionary school. Um, and in turn, missionary school were generally run on the initiative of Africa. Um, so if you look at this table, you can see, for instance, that there were, um, you know, like, the, the number of government expenditure per person enrolled in primary education were, um, you know, very low. You know, 0 0.5 in uh, Sierra Leone and Ghana, 0 0.9. But look at this difference in Northern Rhodesia, for instance, uh, starting in 2020 between the natives and the Europeans. It was more. It was you know, more than I don't know, uh, 20 or 40 times what was spent on, 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 on Africans, actually far more. So it just shows the huge discrepancy between expenditure on natives, Africans, and on Europeans. It's very interesting because the goal of the colonial authority was to provide what they call practical rudimentary um, education um, and turning non young native into workers who speak and write French. So that was a quote by the Lieutenant Governor of Senegal in 1903. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of kind of um, evidence suggesting that the curriculum was adapted um, to, you know, basically to, to serve the, the, uh, the economic interest of, uh, of, the, colonial, of the colonial rule, uh, you know, through grants uh, provided to mission schools and, and so on. Now, let me look at uh, the impact. So three things, it's, you know, um, the huge regional disparity, that's one. Second, the level of investment was really minimal, minimal to the point where non-existence in many places. And third, the curriculum was basically, um, you know, focus on basically teaching uh, very little, uh, the, enough to make uh, young Africans functional, but not enough for them uh, to be able, uh, you know, to, to move up and socially and in terms of, um, uh, and professionally. So despite this limited uh, investment, the impact was actually impressive, you know, 
um, in a paper that I wrote, I, I show, for instance, that um, um, individual from who live in individuals who were educated or who live in a place with school had much, much better living standard and better social network compared to those living in a place with no school. And those individuals who were educated, they're also um, you know, less likely to be farmer. So it means that uh, education creates a, a degree of um, uh, economic uh, transformation, uh, structural transformation, uh, occupation diversity. And at the same time, those were more politically active. So um, this figure show not only um, what I just said for the first generation, but also for the, for the second generation. So, uh, it, it, so despite the limit to education, it has, it's very clear that it changed lives of people who are exposed to it. You know, it changed not only the, the individual lives, but that's of, those are of, of their family members, but of the community where they live. You know, if you if you look at a village with school, village without school, what is also interesting is that we observe not only strong intergenerational mobility, but also reduce reduction of income inequality in that place. You know, so while within village, there is a big gap between with school, with those with school and those without school, you are a big gap between um, you know. So, sorry, you have a big gap between places with school, places without school. But if you look at places with school, the degree of economic social inequality has reduced. And you, you, you wish I will talk later on um, in one of my my presentation, maybe in two or three weeks, about uh, the emergence of uh, African political elite. This is a picture of the Pan African Congress in 1945. And I should also stress the fact that it's not just African you know, basically um, self-learn or self-taught um, what they should have learned in high school or, or, or at the university. The, it's not only the fact they connected with uh, an African diaspora, it's also the fact that they interacted and they, they, they connected with uh, the international so socialist movement. And so, so, so it's important to, to notice that education enable you know, the emerging elite to break from isolation and connect globally, not only with the US, but also with, uh, um, with, with, the, with um, the international socialist movement. But when they got into power, they actually enacted policies to break from the colonial education policies. One of the great examples is a pre parametric education policy uh, by uh, uh, Chief um, Obafemi Olawo in, in Western Nigeria, so when he got into power in 1952, um, he basically um, he, he, he enacted a pre-primary education scheme that was considered the biggest expansion of education in colonial Africa, nearly doubling the number of primary schools that was created from 1952 to 1954. And as a result, 50% of children between age of six and 12 were beneficiaries of the program. And uh, you know, girls' education benefited massively, and this created positive spillover not only for the lower market but for the economy. And you know, what, what is very remarkable is that you can even sense the impact of that policy across the border um, in Benin. So this is my a picture of my primary school, which is right like two kilometers away or three kilometers away from the Nigerian border. In contrast to most schools in Benin my class was gender balanced, you know? So it shows that the, you know, the drive for education, particularly for girls, had an impact even in places where, um, you know, uh, that policy was not implemented. Anyway, so uh, let me finish by, by giving some uh, key takeaways. The supply was restricted to a point that colonial education was non-existent, in fact, in most part of Africa. And the fact that African did so much with this little, despite the colonial power to suppress dissent, highlight the transformational power of education on individuals, families, and societies. So historical distortion persists in post-colonial time, therefore, an expansion of the quality of education uh, remains 
a very, very urgent uh, necessity. Thank you very much.